Kelly Guerin. She's a couch and valley based musician who, who's uh, our musical guest for this show and Matt Carter will have more with her later on. Uh, today's show is packed full of interviews and entertainment. We have two new guest hosts. Well, they're volunteers of ours, uh, Ian Holmes and Kim Plum Plumley. And uh, Ian will be uh, doing an interview about an autism awareness event while Kim is going to uh, getting all artsy with the uh, Spring Glass Art Show. We're also highlighting two different websites today, uh, one to help teens counter bullying and the other one about real estate investing. Also in the lineup, the Vancouver Island Economic Alliance will host the second annual Linking Island Business Networking event. Finally, just in time for Easter, we've got uh, some tips on decorating beautiful Visanki egg. All that and much more on this 23rd edition of the show. Alrighty, welcome to the show. School to Succeed have launched a new proactive website in coordination with the Nanaimo RCMP and the Vancouver Island Christ Center to help teens combat bullying, violence, and suicidal thought. To help us understand of this new site, today we're joined by District Principal of Student Support Services, Mr. Bob Esslinger, and NDS student, Rachel. Uh, welcome to the show. Thank you guys for coming. Uh, Bob, exactly what is this site? Well, this site is... Um was made actually it's community based as you said and it was made to give teens and youth in our community access to supports and services 24 7. and so the purpose is basically that if i'm being bullied or i need help is to go to the site tntnanaimo.com and that's all there exactly the site actually serves two purposes for our for our youth uh, the first purpose is that it will give them access to uh, community agencies that they may not know are available to them and the second is to report online uh, instances of bullying or harassment. And so this is kind of the, the new up-to-date thing because I know you can get on your smartphones, your Blackberry iPhones, that's all available. So if I went my Blackberry, tntnime.com, it'd be, I could read it? Well, exactly. That's the, the point is that it's, it's what teens use. It, it's uh, available and ac accessible to them 24-7. And they're very familiar with the technology. It's not to say that these things aren't, or these resources and services are not already available in our community. They are but we want them to be available to our youth 24-7. So Rachel, your grade 10 student in NDSS, is there an online bullying, you know, via Facebook, Twitter, MSN? Definitely, I mean, Facebook and Twitter have just made it that much easier to just type a few words and click send. Um, we've noticed it a lot more um, with Facebook just sending like harassing messages and it's really disturbing because you see it, it's just, it's there for everyone to read. So this new website, tntnanaimo.com, do you think this site will help teens get help, or do you think it's just going to be another website on the web? Um, I really hope that it goes through, just because it's made especially for students in the Nanaimo and Ladysmith district, and it just it offers local help. Um, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but um, it's anonymous, so when you fill out the form, it's sending it right to your vice principal and counselor and principal. And so I really hope people can take advantage of it. Yeah, great. So everyone at home right now, they're, uh, well, they were getting a little glimpse of, of this thing. So as uh, Rachel was just saying, so say I go fill this form, and uh, uh, who will find out? Will my principal, my, my mom, my dad, uh, the RCMP, who is going to get this information? OK. Um, so when the form gets completed, before you actually get to the form, when a, a youth is wanting to fill it out, they, there comes uh, two questions. Uh, is it an emergency? And of course, if it's an emergency, the site will directly automatically to the RCMP to a 911 call. Uh, if it's uh, outside of school hours, whether it's holidays or in the summer, it also will make mention of the fact that uh, the site will send it to your principal during school time, during school hours, during the school year. And at other times, if it's an emergency, contact the RCMP. So to play mm -hmm. devil's advocate a little bit, you know, let's say a group of teenagers, you know, Friday night and they want to do kind of a joke, you know, let's just say we're being bullied, let's just send a little message to tntnanaimo.com. Are you guys concerned about that? Concerned, no. Um, we hope that teens will use it. We, kn we all always, we will anticipate that there will be some instances of, of pranks and we, we're going to take every one of them seriously. So let's talk about this. I was at the site uh, not too long ago and there's this 
possibly of winning an iPad? Yeah. Well, what's that about? Well, that's an incentive. We, we are hoping that teens will want to check this, this app out, this uh, site out. And so to get youth to go there, we have um, a, a draw for a, an iPad. And uh, you know, the, all the information about this iPad and the draw is on the TNT site. And we're hoping that local businesses will be interested and, and get a hold of us and say that they'd like to, to sponsor one of these, these uh, draws. Yeah. So when did this site go live? You know, when were you guys thinking, you know, we need to do this? Do you want to answer that? Sure. Um, it actually, they um, sent it out on February 29th, which is um, Pink Shirt Day or Anti-Bullying Day. So that's the last Wednesday of February. And I think it was just perfect timing for yeah. it to come out. Yeah. So we did this joint um, press release or news conference, yeah. and Rachel was there, and we met with the media, and we launched the site. It was, awesome. Well, yeah. thank you guys for coming in. Uh, thank you, Ms. Lester. Thank you, Rachel. We all know bullying is a serious thing, so if you're looking for help or resources, please visit the site that, again, is tntnanaimo.com. Now we're going to pass things over to Dunya Tosi, who has some Easter egg decorating. Dunya? <laughs> Thanks, Tally. Well, uh, Easter is just around the corner, and that means it's time for eat chocolate Easter bunnies and uh, Easter eggs. And, well, you know, there's so many different ways to decorate Easter eggs, but one of my favorite ways is the Ukrainian pisankiwe. And here we've got with us today Jean Rudy from the Ukrainian Cultural Center to show us and uh, tell us, give us some tips on how to make these. They, they look really harder than, you know, <laughs> than, than what I think, like, like the normal things that I buy from Walmart. <laughs> yes, and these are not edible. Uh, we're n they're not food color, they're special commercial aniline dyes. I see, I see. And I see that you, you've gotten already a head start on one of them that we're going to be showing later on. But, um, I mean, Ukrainian Easter egg, egg decorating goes back a long, long way, way before Christ. How did it get incorporated into Easter? Oh, traditionally in pagan times, the symbols on the eggs would symbolize the sun for growth. Uh, the egg was a very power, powerful symbol. It symbolized a new season, new life, rebirth. And later when the Ukrainians adopted Christianity in 988, a lot of the symbols developed religious significance. Continuous lines around an egg would be eternity. Um, a fish would set, represent Christ the fisherman. Oh, so a lot of the, and then you started to see things like crosses, Pussy willows, very Easter Christ, uh, traditional type of patterns. I see that there's a variety of patterns here. Where do you get the ideas from? <laughs> oh, I have hundreds of pictures of eggs from books, postcards. Um, this was a, a, a Mother's and Father's Day card, um, just all over the place, postcards. And after a while, you just basically create your own. And I don't just do traditional Ukrainian ones. I also do Halloween eggs and Christmas eggs. Neat. Um, That's awesome. Wow. And, and how long have you been doing this for? I probably got started doing them consistently about high school. That's when my aunt gave me all her supplies, and I started doing it from there. Uh, but I learned probably when I was eight or nine years old at the church hall in Port Alberni and somebody's <laughs> grandmother was showing how to do it. Of course at that time we didn't have the commercial dyes. We boiled the color out of crepe paper. Oh interesting. Originally wow. the dyes would be made out of what was available in nature. They'd use yellow mm -hmm. um, from onion skins. They'd use like beet juice for the pink and purple colors. So whatever is available in nature that's what they made their colors from and a lot of the recipes were actually family secrets and the eggs were made traditionally by the women in the household after the children had gone to bed. It was very serious business because what you were doing was taking the goodness in the household and putting the patterns on your egg and chasing away evil and bringing <laughs> good luck to your home for the next year. Nice and I, I, I've always wondered like some of these I, I feel like they're empty and I know some of them are not empty so I mean First of all, like how do you empty them? And, and you were talking about the, the life well, of the egg, right? Yes, traditionally the Ukrainians did not empty the eggs because that was the whole point was that it held new life, the promise of rebirth. So an empty egg, in a sense, would be a dead egg. Mm -hmm. And they actually would decorate eggs that were from the chickens that had been fertilized so that they, again, were a promise of new life and fertile for the next year. <laughs> and to stay for a long yes. time, I guess. <laughs> um, so for somebody who's a beginner, uh, I know you're from Ukrainian heritage, but like, what, what do you need to start? What, what, what are some of the supplies that you need? 
Well, the instrument the we put the wax on, it, the word pisanka comes from the word pasati, which means to write. Okay. What you are doing is actually writing the pattern on the egg with melted wax. They would use a tool. Originally, it was made out of wood, and there'd be a little piece of uh, metal that was shaped into a funnel. So there's the wide end and then the bottom. So they would mm -hmm. heat it in a candle, with a candle. and <laughs> uh, put the beeswax is used and natural beeswax will turn black oh, when it's heated. Okay. Um, I use an electric kiska. And is it faster to use an electric Much one? faster yeah. because with the handheld one, you always have to go to the candle, heat it up, and then put it Wait, on your egg yeah. and then it cools and you, it's the back and forth. Uh, with the electric kiska, your lines can be much more consistent. Oh, I see. Um, the little bit of wax flows a long way. It's heated all the time, so you just let oh, the wax there. melt in and then it flows out the bottom. And then you start putting the wax on in there. Yes. And I guess you have to have a pretty steady hand to... <laughs> well, it's <laughs> actually it easier to work quicker. If you go really slow, then your heart's going to beat or the table's going to wiggle or your breathe. But if you just sort of let it flow, that seems to work easier. And <laughs> what you're doing is creating a resistance by the wax. So when I dip the egg in the next lightest color, which will probably be yellow, then all the lines that are on the egg currently are going to stay white. Oh, I see. So then when I dip the egg in yellow, then whatever part of the pattern I want to stay yellow, I'm going to cover that with wax. So I'm saving the color on the egg with the wax. I see, And you go I see. through your progression of colors until the darkest color at the end. And then at the end, you remove the wax and all of your colors yes. show through. Beautiful eggs afterwards. Well, we'll come back uh, to Jean later on in the show, at, towards the end of the show, to see how far she's come with the egg that she's working on right now. But for now, we're moving on to Bob Fenty, who's uh, talking to the uh, Rotary uh, District. Uh, <laughs> well, actually, yeah, he's talking to somebody from the Rotary. <laughs> Thanks, Junia. And yes, today we do have with us uh, Mr. David Stocks on our show. Uh, David is Rotary's district governor for District 5020, and uh, District 5020 covers an absolutely huge, huge area, all of Vancouver Island and western Washington state. And as I said, it's a big, big area. Welcome, David, to our show. Thank you, Bob. You've made a, actually, you've made a, a really tremendous commitment and, and contribution to Rotary in District 5020, David. And, what motivated you to, uh, to devote so much of your time? The simple answer, Bob, is pleasure or joy. It is an enormous joy to, to play out acts of service for other people. Rotary is a phenomenal mechanism or tool or device by which an ordinary person like me can do magic all over the world. Incredible. Yeah, you're right. During your year of, as district governor, travel, I'm sure, must have been very constant on your mind all the time. How did you and your wife, Frances, manage to plan and, and enable you to visit 88 clubs in our district? Well, it wasn't so much me and my wife, Frances. It was my wife, Frances, who did the oh. plan. <laughs> having having uh, concern for uh, the 600-mile height of our district uh, and worrying about the ferry schedules, because in the winter, of course, the ferry doesn't run all that often to Port Angeles from Victoria. So it was, we traveled every week from the 7th of July till the 9th of December, except one week where we spent the whole time at home. Really? Yeah, that must have been at Christmas time, was it? When you relaxed and enjoyed <laughs> yourself? Sure. During your career, David, you, you traveled extensively, and I, I'll go back, I'll take you back to Montreal, to Edmonton, to Calgary, Seattle, Kamloops, Caldwood, and now Victoria. But, but I know there really is, there's another special spot in your heart uh, for our youth of, our, of the world. And tell us briefly, if you would, about the high school in Malawi for, for young girls. In the last couple of months of 2005, a young teacher from Pearson College came to my Rotary Club and started talking about this dream of building a high school for poor girls in a rural part of Malawi. And it was a crazy idea. I mean, very, very impractical. But one thing led to another. We did some planning, did some fundraising, and we built the school. Francis and I have been there, we've met with the Board of Trustees over there, we've inspected the school, uh, the school director and the project manager have been over to visit us here, and it's now one of the top three high schools for girls in Malawi. Wonderful, and it, actually there must have been a lot of fundraising involved as well, was there, to, to get the school up and running? Yes, the whole project, as originally defined, is about $2.2 million. Wow. There are 36 Rotary Clubs and about 300 Rotarians supporting the school. 
Well, as your year has gone, gone along, I'm sure you've encouraged so many around you to look at the countless opportunities that are available to, for Rotarians to serve, not only in their community, but also around the world. And in one of your essays, you mentioned the feast of opportunities that are available. And uh, tell us briefly, if you would, David, that, those are just fascinating. Well, Rotary's trying to do five basic things. Um, disease prevention and treatment. And as you know, we've pretty well conquered polio around the world. We have. Um, water and sanitation, safe water uh, is a pretty necessary ingredient. We're trying to reduce maternal mortality and the death of, early, of young children, spread basic literacy and entrepreneurial skills and get people microcredit or whatever so they can start a little business and make a living. But all of those de cannot be done in a war zone. So our first, the first of our areas of focus is peace and conflict resolution. Wonderful opportunity, yes, and you're right. There's so many things that Rotary does that the world really doesn't know about, and uh, as you've mentioned, there's a number of them there. David, in, in your last newsletter, you mentioned that any Rotarian who read that newsletter and didn't learn something, you were going to buy them <laughs> an appetizer or dessert at, in Victoria at the, at the district conference. And you know, I've learned so much listening to you and, and researching you that I'm going to buy you a dessert in Victoria oh, next weekend. Good plan. Chocolate mousse and with you know, strawberry sauce. Yeah, it's coming. <laughs> David, thank you so much for taking time from your busy, busy schedule. I know you're leaving here. You're off to Port Alberni to, to visit another Rotary Club. And you're coming back to, Port, to, to Parksville. And again, so yes, thank you very much for taking time to come on our show. A and now Bob. we're back for a station break. Hi, I'm Robert Davison from Top Shelf Feeds, inviting you to watch Top Shelf Feeds Pet Tales, only on Shaw TV. An entertaining look into the world of pets and animals, whether furry, hairless, feathered, or even scaled, we cover them all. Tune in for tips on how to care for your animals or fall in love with the SPCA pet, featured on every episode of Top Shelf Feeds Pet Tales, only on Shaw TV. Welcome back to the show. What show? The show. Only on Shaw TV. The show. Only on Shaw TV. That was the beautiful music uh, for, uh, of Kelly Guerin again, and we'll have more from her on the show later on. Uh, but now we're moving on into real estate. Uh, and Nanaimo-based real estate investment uh, website was recently voted the best real estate investing website in Canada. And this website is headed by an Nanaimo professional real estate investor and blogger, Julie Broad, and her husband, Dave. And Julie's with us today to share a little bit about her website. Welcome, Julie. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, so Julie, the best website, the best uh, real estate investment website in all over Canada. And this is the second year in a row. Yeah. How does that feel? It's amazing. It, and it was voted on by the readers of Canadian Real Estate Magazine. So we're really grateful because it's not just, you know, it's people who are reading our stuff that have voted us best website. So that's pretty cool. Wow. So, and your website is called Revenue, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. what is it all about? Well, we started it years ago when we, uh, we watch one of those late night infomercials, you know, <laughs> I'm sure you've seen some of those oh, where yeah. the, you know, big name guys come into town with this free session at a local hotel. And we went to that session and, <laughs> you know, we got really pumped up about investing in real estate. So we signed up for the courses and went gung ho. And we bought lots of properties. This was 11 years ago, which is great, except for nobody taught us that <laughs> some of these properties, if you buy them in rougher areas, you can have really bad tenants. We had actually, we actually made the paper, this was in Ontario, but we made the paper for having a local crack house. Oh my God. Our property manager had just let it get 
really run down and we weren't in town so we weren't overseeing it and yeah we have all kinds of crazy stories which is how we got into writing about it and putting it on the website and starting to help other people because what happened was about five years into it after we cleaned up a lot of the mess we'd gone through we looked at it and we went oh some of the things you know we had good properties too and what we had done to get those good properties it was repeatable mm -hmm. and what had happened to lead us to the crack house and a few other choice properties was preventable and we wanted to help other people avoid the crack houses <laughs> and make the money and build their wealth with the good properties wow so for those of us who don't know a lot about real estate investment um, what is it about I mean how do you get into it well for us it's about buying great homes that attract good tenants that we can rent out for the long term mm -hmm. and if you want to get into it you know it, it's as simple as doing some market research you know getting out with a realtor looking at properties but then of course you know it takes a little time to figure out where the good deals are make sure it's gonna cash flow for you because that's key you want to be able to rent it out and cover all your costs and have a little buffer so you can hold this for the long term. Isn't it kind of a big risk to do this? I mean, were you scared at the start? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't sleep for quite a few nights on our first deal, but it's with real estate, you make money in three different ways. So you're covered. It's a, a stronger investment than a lot of other places because you know, with stocks, you make money only if the stock goes up. Mm -hmm. But with real estate, even if it doesn't go up, my tenant is paying down my mortgage and I'm collecting rent, which puts a little bit of money in my pocket every month. Mm -hmm. So even if the house never goes up in value, I'm still building my wealth over the long term. So time eases a lot of the pain that you might feel in real estate if the price drops a little bit. And you guys have been doing it for a while now. How has it been for well, you? It's, <laughs> I think it's been really good. <laughs> We've enjoyed some very nice six-figure paydays, and you know we live off the investment money that we're making yeah, from, our, awesome. from our rental properties. So. It's, it's going well. So is it something that anybody can get into, do you think? Well, I, I think anybody that wants to work to do it, it, yeah. It's not something that you wake up and, yeah, I'm going to be an investor today, and you just go do it, and you make a bucket of money. <laughs> you know, it doesn't quite work like that. But if you want to work, you know, and that's really what we do, is we help people who want to get into real estate, want to mitigate as many risks as they can. That's what we do. Mm -hmm. And I guess you have to do a lot of research beforehand, right? Yeah. So, you know, to get into that risk and everything and weighing the pros and cons of everything. Yeah, you won't know a good house until you've looked at 20, 20, 30 houses. Just, just one last question. Is it a good time right now to, to do this? I mean, to invest in real estate? Well, I can Is answer by telling you what we're doing. I've bought about 25 houses in Nanaimo in the last two years. So, wow. I obviously think it's a good time. <laughs> <laughs> there's never a bad time, I guess. Well, thank you so much, Julie, for being here. And I know there's more info and tips on your website, re uh, revenue.com. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. And you can check the website out. It has a lot, a lot of tips. Uh, but up next, we've got Tally Campbell, who's talking business. Alrighty, thank you, Dunya. Today we are joined with George Hansen, the president of the Vancouver Economic Alliance, to talk about the upcoming second annual Linking Island Businesses event in Qualcomm this April 11th from 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. at the Qualcomm Beach Centre. Thank you for coming, George. Yeah. What exactly is this Linking event? Well, the Linking Island Business event is a trade show and networking opportunity, especially for, for businesses that are in the Mid-Island region that, that are looking for opportunities for business development and working together, learning together. So how exactly does this event help local businesses? Well, it brings, brings people together. In 2010, the Vancouver Island Economic Alliance did a, an island-wide research on how people and businesses could collaborate better. And we heard loud and clear through that, uh, that research that people wanted more opportunities for business-to-business -business, uh, networking and information sharing and looking at how to collaborate, build partnerships, and expand their businesses locally. So there'll be booths available for businesses. Mm -hmm. uh, how many booths are there available? I think there are about 45 booths altogether, and we have about eight of them still remaining. So if people are interested, they can. They and now, is there certain uh, businesses you're looking at, or is it all over the board? No, well, I don't. I don't. It's wide ranging. So we have we have businesses from from quality foods to array studios, from uh, banks to investment advisors, and everyone in between. So you said there's about eight left to mm -hmm. take? Okay, how, if I'm, if I'm a business owner, I'm looking to you know, take this booth, how do I register? You can go online at uh, VIEA, that's V-I-E-A dot C-A, and there's a, a registration online. You can go right through the process. So can you give me more details about the trade show? Mm -hmm. So the trade show is, uh, it opens at 11 o'clock in the morning. It goes till 6 in the evening. 
Uh, there's a luncheon served in the trade show. There's a coffee break in the trade show. We have a reception at the end. Um, Tainamara is doing the luncheon, and Quality Foods is doing the reception. And we have six presentations that are happening um, also at the event. And within the trade show itself, some of the trade show people will be doing little um, mini presentation sort of learning opportunities so how to take best advantage of social media how to uh, take it best advantage of your advertising dollars etc so it's open to the public it's open to the public is yeah. there a cost yes uh, members of VIA can register for $35 for the day and uh, non-members is $45 for the day and I'm guessing it's obviously worth it it's we believe it's very much worth it so yes. how did this event start the first annual how did it start it started uh, the first event was last April in Parksville this one is at the Qualicum Beach Civic Center and it started as a result of that island-wide research where businesses told us that they wanted more opportunity to engage with each other so how did the Vancouver Island Economic Alliance get involved well the Vancouver Island Alliance uh, started the event uh, did the research that led to the event and is now continuing to to drive the event forward and you know, part of the presentation of the event is topical uh, sessions that we believe are important to businesses. So one of the sessions uh, sponsored by BC Hydro, for instance, is about how businesses can access contract opportunities with the John Hart uh, uh, Hydro project that's happening in Campbell River. Uh, Raven Coal Mine is doing a, an information session to tell people about what they're doing and what's going on with that. Uh, Myers North Penny or MMP now is uh, is doing a session on succession planning to help uh, young entrepreneurs interested in buying businesses and what to look for and for aging entrepreneurs who are looking to sell their businesses how, how they do an exit strategy. So did the Vancouver Economic Alliance get this thing started? Yes. So what kind of businesses have already signed up? You know, if I'm a person looking to yeah. come on by, what kind yeah. of businesses can I expect to be there? Wide range of businesses, uh, s sign shops, uh, banks, uh, web producers, uh, uh, event managers, all kinds of businesses have signed up. And so I, I forgot to touch on this, but what it, would it cost if I was a business that wants to get involved? To, to be yeah, in the to trade be show? to be a booth. If you have a trade show booth, it's $295 for the 11 to 6 period. It comes with two passes to the event. Uh, it features your business in the program, and away you go. So how did last year go? Last year went very well for a first-time event. I think we had uh, well over 200 people there, and it's, it, was, it was very well received. So are you, is this from other com uh, communities? Are other communities doing this type of stuff? Or is this kind of the first thing? Uh, well, it was in Parksville last year, Qualicum this year. We're not sure where it will be next year. But, yeah. All righty. Thank you, George. You uh, that again, for thank you for being here, sorry, and letting us know about the second annual, uh, annual business event in Qualicum Beach. For more information, you can visit their website at viea.ca. Now it's time for some more music. are listening to the sounds of a wonderful multi-instrumentalist, guitar, accordion apparently, as well as piano. You're going to hear later a fine vocalist as well in bluegrass, folk, country, all sorts of great styles. And she also describes herself as half hippie, half redneck. Welcome to the show, Kelly Gervin. Thank you. You're very welcome. All right, who came up with that line anyways, half hippie, half redneck? Um, I think it just kind of evolved from the place I grew up, a little bit of you know, redneckish northern Alberta ways and then moving to Vancouver Island and kind of, um, you know, leaning towards more the leftist kind of hippie movement, I guess. So, All right, yeah. Yes, fitting in nicely, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you mentioned yeah. Uh, growing up in northern Alberta, so yeah. I did a little research. You grew yeah. up in Hines Creek, which yeah. I hoped was the birthplace of ketchup. <laughs> no, it's did, not. No, different like, different, different uh, spelling of Hines. Ending. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So but named after a fur trader. And I yeah. looked it up again. It's about <laughs> halfway between Edmonton and the Northwest Freakin' Territories. It is, yeah. And I got a kick looking at the website. <laughs> it said the population was approximately 
396 people. It was 500 when I was there. The so boom that's days. gone down. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. So yeah. tell us sort of what it was like <laughs> growing up in an environment like that, and sort of what was the music um, scene there? What got you into music in a little place like that? I grew up on my aunt's and uncle's knees, playing the spoons and in the kitchen having jams and stuff like that. Um, I played piano from a very early age, and uh, that's kind of been my my passion underneath everything that I've been doing. So, Absolutely. just for my family, basically. Mm -hmm. family was it mostly uh, mostly country music, roots music? Yeah, sort of roots stuff kind of music, Appalachian, um, country western. Grew up. Johnny Cash is my favorite artist ever. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So, no, of course, the man yeah. in black. Of course, you are the woman yeah, in black. Yeah, I guess here. so. Yeah, I guess. Exactly. Yeah. So, <laughs> what is it about Johnny Cash's music that you love, and how much do you put his sounds, his music, into your own um, compositions? I liked his simplicity. Actually, um, when he first started out, it was just upright bass and him and a lead guitar player and uh, I found his lyrics to be very soulful and it just he sings from the heart everything he does and I always just had a great appreciation for his movement as well because he kind of bucked the system every once in a while so absolutely yeah, yeah. bit of a renegade a little bit of a renegade yeah absolutely, absolutely yeah cool. and so you talk again about Cash's group being small and yourself I mean you obviously do some solo performing but also play I with do. a gentleman named uh, Jeff Ellis yes correct yes. and yes. Instant, he, he's a fellow from Virginia yes so how'd you guys meet up in the couch and valley of all places um, to start playing your music well I'm a elementary yeah. school music teacher and um, I was programming and organizing an arts and culture week and I was happened to talking with the uh, um, kindergarten teacher, and she said, "Oh, my husband plays music, and so it's her husband." And we ended up meeting up. He came and did a bluegrass demonstration. Oh, very cool! So he brought in all of his instruments, and then um, ended up playing with him and his band out at the shipyard in a place called Maple Bay, just outside of Duncan. And that's where I started last year, just singing along with them, and it kind of just progressed from there. And and so now we've got, him and I did an album together, so it's great. Yeah, he oh, did all the cool. instruments, and I uh, wrote all the songs and played rhythm guitar, and he did everything else, so is it's great. Is that the album right behind us? It is. All right. <laughs> Thank you, yeah, Reach. Buddy. All right, come on, Derek, focus in, buddy. All right, this is the album here. Pieces of the puzzle. And I mentioned this is available uh, from, from you at your shows. Yes, And yeah. uh, can you also stream some of the songs online as well? Yes, yeah, through Reverb Nation and CBC Radio 3. Very nice. <laughs> now you did mention as well a teacher in an elementary school, so yes. you should probably look in the camera and wave hello to your students. Hi. <laughs> Hi which kids. Which elementary school is it at? At Alexander Elementary in Duncan. Yeah. Now you told us an interesting thing off air about how you actually have a different name when you're I in do. your teacher role. Yes. Sort of deal. Um, I wear my glasses and I go by a different name when I'm teaching and then when I'm out and about doing my shows I'm a different person I guess. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, generally because I'm singing songs about whiskey and drinking and carrying on and stuff like that. <laughs> something that my kids exactly. don't need to see. So. <laughs> That's right, all. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. All right, well, again, uh, we've heard some uh, examples of your guitar playing, so we're going to have a song coming up here soon yes. with some vocals as well. Now, I know uh, after your song, we do have some segments uh, featuring eggs and glass, <laughs> proving as Perfect. well if you live in glass houses, you shouldn't throw eggs either. <laughs> Otherwise, it's going to be Easter famine. <laughs> And of course, they're very fragile. And again, the song you're about to play for us here has a bit of a fragile nature as well, perhaps fragile of the heart. What's the name it of the is. song? It's and tell us a bit about it. It's start over, and it's about starting over your life, basically. Yeah, finding the good things in bad situations. <laughs> Perfect. All right, well, again, all the way down from Northern Alberta to BC. Uh, thank you. Couch and Valley. So glad to have you uh, joining you. an amazing music scene here on Vancouver Island. Yes, so thank you. Kelly Gervin here on the show on Shaw. <laughs> over to you. Thank you. Well, this is the start over A turning point in my life I Try to pick up all the pieces Hoping I can do things right They say you get what you put out there this I'm finding to be true I wear a mask of many faces Sometimes I find it hard to choose I like to drive off in the sunset 
down some dusty gravel road. I'd like to drink my wine and spirits. And hear you tell me you want me alone. And hear you tell me you want me alone. I forgot how much fun it was to laugh and have help on the way and just like you I understand I sometimes fall and lose my place I like the honesty of your life I used to think I wanted another But I'm fine and I'm drifting back there I only hope that you'll let me stay I'd like to drive off in the sunset Down some dusty gravel road I'd like to drink my wine and spirits And hear you tell me you want me alone Tell me you want me alone And here you tell me you want me alone And here you tell me you want me alone And here you tell me you want me alone And here you tell me you want me <laughs> Thank you. And now, back to the show, only on Shaw TV. Welcome back. Well, glass is more than window dressing. It's a great art. So today I'm joined by Chris Smith, and he's one of the glass artists who's part of Island Glass Art Show that's coming up on April the 7th, right? That's right. Right. And that's at the Vancouver Island Conference Center. And welcome, my fellow lens villain. Thank you. <laughs> thanks, thanks for having me. Well, I'm very excited to hear because I really like shiny things, so this is perfect <laughs> for me. Um, so, so I know that show's coming up, and you have a variety of um, artists who are part of it. Can you tell me a little bit about the artists who are part of it? Uh, we have a core group of the Island Glass Arts is, is 14 studios that are based on Vancouver and the Gulf Islands. In this particular show, 10 studios are showing. Um, we have anything from blown glass to kiln cast glass to mm -hmm. fine glass jewelry, glass beads. Yeah. Um, sort of, it's all about glass. We have stained glass. Um, it's all the different ways that you can create with glass. Right. So um, I know that we have some people coming from Gabriola. I happened to be on Gabriola this weekend, so I had to go and visit Jane Furland. And Jane makes beautiful little boxes and big, beautiful architectural pieces for homes. Um, but I just wanted people to know that there's going to be a variety of things there, right? Well, the other, the other Gabriel artists are the Illuminati Glassworks. Mm -hmm. That's Dan, Dan and Jim. And they do primarily fused glass art for the, for the home and for the garden. Mm -hmm. um, and they do jewelry. Uh, we have Bill and Bonnie from Cedar Moon Glass up in, up in Qualicum Bay. Mm -hmm. um, he's a lot of sandblasted glass, a lot of glass, fused glass, a lot of glass jewelry again. Mm -hmm. uh, myself, you can see some of my handiwork. I brought this to give you an idea of the different kinds of glass that, that we have. We have Claude and Linda from Rhythms Art Glass in Chimanus. They're, mm -hmm. they're well-known glass blowers. Uh, their work is, is collected internationally. Um, let's see, we have Jane, yeah. uh, we have, as well, we have Brenda, Brenda McIntyre of Cheeky Monkey Glass, right, which is downtown. the stained glass mm -hmm. shop downtown, teaches stained glass, teaches fused glass, teaches glass stepping stones, all neat, all the kinds of things you can do with, with, mm -hmm. with cool glass. Nice. Um, let's see, who else have we got? We've got Joe and Peggy from Kiln Art Glass who make beautiful glass jewelry and, and Joe's beautiful little bowls. He calls them things of beauties or, or tobs. <laughs> um, who else? Who else? We have, we have Bill and Michael from mm -hmm. 
Jameson, or pardon me, um, 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 oh, Michael. Uh, <laughs> what's Michael's first name? Give me the card. Oh, here's your card. Jameson, Jameson, Anthony Jameson Designs, Bill, mm -hmm. and, Bill and Michael, on Main Island. They do large kiln cast architectural panels. Right. Um, have I forgotten anybody? If they right. have, they're going to kill me. <laughs> uh, LG Art, Halima. Uh, mm -hmm. And Halima is a, is a glass blower who uses um, laboratory glass and really? does beautiful stemware. Mm -hmm. uh, and we also have Red Room Glass, which makes absolutely gorgeous, Damaris makes absolutely gorgeous beads. They have whole little worlds inside wow. of them. They're just fabulous. She teaches in Toronto. She's basically internationally uh, recognized and, right. and uh, collected. So tell me a little bit about this piece. It's it's quite a variety of things, and I, I know it's one of your creations. So there's something in it. That well, this you're this this, on. this is basically a, a, my homage to water, and okay. it's water in its many forms. Um, but it's primarily it's it's kiln it's kiln cast glass, and this is solid glass. Oh. It's probably about over ten pounds of glass, five plus kilos, so over ten pounds of glass, eleven pounds. Um, the glass has been cast, some of it has been cast and polished, and then some of it has been sandblasted. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. We have... This is, I, I've seen your studio and you in action with your, your sandblasting. It is something to be seen. He does do um, tours in his studio in Lanceville. So explain us uh, how sandblasting works. Well, basically, sandblasting is, is you take your, your piece of glass and you visualize your image. You're going to lay on a, a piece of resist, a piece of vinyl. Right. You're going to cut it out, and then you're going to sandblast the pieces that you want to appear the closest or the deepest, and you're going to work your way through. So in the case of, say, the codfish here, right. I'll sandblast his inner eyeball first and the veins in his fins, and then I'll sandblast his outer eyeball, and then I'll sandblast his gills, and I'll work my way right. forward until I got the whole body of the fish. Lots of detail. Uh, lots of, uh, yeah, your studio, you've got it all laid out and how it's all going to work and, yeah. and the whole little, I love that the sand blasting is downstairs and yeah. very exciting. Um, you have taught a lot of these people who are being part of the show. Not uh, a lot of them. I've, oh. I've only had, and I'm not going, I'm not going to sit and say or look at, you know, <laughs> not going to try to claim glory in my students' work, so I'm going to, I'm going to leave well, that one okay, alone. Okay, okay. But few there's people. very exciting people coming and yeah. very gifted people yeah. um, and making glass into this amazing functional Mm -hmm. um, there's architectural, and we also have beautiful jewelry, yes. which is very exciting. <laughs> Sorry, I hit my mic. Yeah. Um, but yeah, amazing things. And there's all sorts of price points, I think, for yeah. people to come in. So if you are looking for the big pieces, um, there's certainly those available. And you'll be able to see a lot of really fun and, and interesting, very West Coast feeling kind of art, too, I've been noticing. Most of the studios are, are able to take commission work. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of them myself, in particular, I've spent years doing architectural stained glass mm -hmm. and sandblasted glass in people's homes and residences right. throughout Nanaimo, uh, Nanus Bay, Parksville, Qualicum. Mm -hmm. so, and a lot of the studios are, are able and willing to do that. And in fact, a few of them are basically, that's what they do in, in Anthony Jameson Designs. Their work is all about commission work. It's all specific, one-of-a-kind, architecturally specific glass. Right. And I know with your sandblasting, you also do a number of awards. You do award um, sandblasting and yep. for people. Um, that's a big business for you as well? That's but more a Cedar, Cedar Moon's Ballywick. Bill, Bill uh, Bassarato was a, was a graphic designer, or is a graphic designer. He was in Vancouver, uh, Surrey, and he sold his studio as a graphic design company and moved his, his operation over here. Mm -hmm. Uh, he's up in Qualicum, Qualicum, like I said, up in Qualicum Beach, mm -hmm. yeah, Qualicum Bay, he's sort of Probably up, that area. yeah, north, mm -hmm. north Qualicum, um, yeah, and he does a lot of a lot of that sort of service award sort of stuff. Great. Well, it's really exciting to see all all the varieties. So, and then this is um, hand drawn. That's a painted. That's something that I got into. Um, we have a really good glass painter in the core group. She Jill. Uh, mm -hmm. Jill from, from Five Heron Studio on Gabriola isn't able to make it to this show because she's involved with the hospital, the health center on Gabriola. Right. Um, my stuff is not, is, a, is not a traditional glass paint. It's, it's new sort of glass enamels right. that you paint and fire on. But they're really okay. fun. I can sort That's of paint great. it. I can throw the whole thing in the kiln. I can fire it up at, one, at what time. I refer to it as collage. Perfect. Well, we're really excited because uh, th this is something to be seen. We are amazing artists. So I'm hoping that people will be able to check it out on April 7th at the Vancouver Conference Center. And it is your website. What is it, sir? The uh, website is www.vancouver.com islandglassart.ca
Excellent, and we thank you so much for coming in and joining us today and, and uh, telling me all about your nice bright shiny things. <laughs> Very exciting. And I'm excited that uh, Dunya is going to do some exciting things. See, I had to put a pun in like Matt did, so I'm <laughs> working on that. Um, anyway, have fun with that, Dunya, and um, thanks. Thank you so much, Kim, and great job. I clap for you on your first interview on TV, live TV. Good job. It's not as hard as you, it looks, eh? Unless you're a pregnant person like me who's a scatterbrained and keeps forgetting everything. But besides the point, uh, Kim will be taking on later after I go on mat leave. She'll be uh, doing the producing, the main producing for the show. So welcome, Kim, to the team. Um, but enough about Kim, and now we're back to the eggs. <laughs> And we have here Jean again, and um, she's going to show us. Uh, well, she did go a little bit far, you know. We, we but it's it, it's a time-consuming process, isn't it? Well, I was mainly working on this egg to basically show to the end. It was orange when we started, so I finished putting on the wax, whatever I wanted to say, orange, and then I dipped it in red dye, okay. and I covered what I wanted to say red in wax. And this is the part where you get to take the wax off and mm, wax off your wax pad. on <laughs> I have to put that uh, karate kid reference no I'm just kidding uh, but so you use the candle for that don't you yes uh, so, so we still use the candle even though we have the technology and everything <laughs> well some people use an oven but I find it's harder oh, to control the heat and of course the egg is raw and it's liquid inside and if it gets too warm the liquid is going to expand and you could end up blowing up your egg in the oven so oh, okay. I use something that's a little more controllable I see. I see wow and you have to be really careful I guess can you like harm the whole egg or well, if you have a pattern with a lot of wax like when you use a handheld kiska you tend to have a thicker layer of wax the electric one is a little finer mm -hmm. but if you have a lot of wax on your egg it's best to do maybe a half or a third at a time because again the egg does get very warm by the time you're finished putting it next to the candle so oh, uh, again you risk the uh, disaster wow. of it blowing up in your hand or starting <laughs> to seep through a, a weak spot in the shell. So. We're starting to see how, how it's looking, the end result here, and it looks really, really nice. So how many, how many layers have you done on that? Well, egg? there's the white of the egg itself, then yellow, orange, red, and then black was okay. the final color for this. So how long is this process? If you, if you really want to take your time, and what's the longest? Uh, well, I've done different size eggs. Uh, probably the longest egg was a goose egg, which actually, they work very well. They take <laughs> the, the dye very egg. nicely, but it, I worked on it probably several hours at a time over about three or four days, so about 20 hours. I see. And you have to be careful if you're mixing colors, if you want red and green and blue in your egg. If you've got red on your egg and you dip it in blue, you're not going to oh, get blue, you're going right, to get brown. Yeah. So there's some parts of the egg where you might have to put a certain color on by hand mm -hmm. with a toothpick, then let it set, cover that, and then dip the whole egg in a color. So again, that can be very time consuming, but I don't usually just work on one egg at a time. Oh, I see. I kind of have an assembly line going, so if one is sitting there with just part of the egg being dyed, then I'm working on another one, so I, and then it's summer being varnished, and it's, it's a whole assembly line. <laughs> wow, it's a, it's a whole lot of work, eh? It's a sl it takes so longer than I thought. Well, we, we, we're we almost done. We have to go, Jean. Yeah. I know we didn't finish, but we yeah. have a beautiful product over we, here. That's the side with the wax, mm. and then you can see. The bright side the bright without side. the wax. Beautiful. Thank you so much, You're Jean, welcome. for coming here. <laughs> and if people want to connect with you, you said uh, your phone number is the best way to connect. Yeah, it's What's 250 So if you want information about where to get supplies or anything or about any workshops we hold then give me a call awesome thank you so much and now up next we've got another new uh, host volunteer it's Ian Holmes and uh, this is his first time um, so well this is his first time so Ian break a leg <laughs> all right doing you thank you very much I'm pleased we join now by uh, Karen Hovestad she is a board member with the Autism Society of Central Vancouver Island here to talk about an upcoming walk which uh, is very important this is a uh, an issue that uh, exploded the past 20 30 years and uh, Karen just talk a little bit about what's coming up here uh, next month in Nanaimo absolutely the Nanaimo walk and bounce this is actually the fourth year of this event um, it will be on April the 21st from 9 to noon at Caledonia Park this is going to be a really exciting fun family event you can want to see that 
<laughs> we have t-shirts for our participants. Uh, we have uh, four bouncy castles because kids love to bounce and we want everybody to bring their kids. We want folks to sign up and walk around the track, individuals, in teams, whatever. Um, there'll be balloons and music and face painting and, and all kinds of stuff for everybody to do. It'll just be that one morning. And it's a very important activity because the Central Vancouver Island Autism Society is raising money to put together a new web-based information center for families, particularly those families who newly diagnosed, don't know where to go, don't know what to do, don't know where to start. So it's a really important activity and we're really hoping to see a lot of people come out. And going with this uh, online uh, angle to, to draw more attention and help people with autism, how will that help people that uh, are, are looking for answers to, to improve their, their quality of lives for themselves and also their children? Well, there, are, there isn't right now uh, a central area or a place for people to go and get information. Mm -hmm. So uh, I know that a lot of families that I've met in the last little while who um, their children have been diagnosed recently or over the last few years and they really do need to know um, exactly where to go, what to do, how to access services, and who to talk to, where to start, where to go next. And that's why we want to build this. You put a lot of your time and energy uh, into local autism uh, needs. Karen, for yourself personally, why did you get involved and why do you put your heart on the line and, and do so much for, for, for people all over Vancouver Island, especially locally? Well, I, I have a daughter um, who was diagnosed with autism when she was uh, about 30 seven months of age um, and at the time I was told that there was no hope mm -hmm. and that's um, a really tough thing for families to cope with and that's why I do it. Excellent. Well Karen uh, that's outstanding thanks a lot uh, for coming on and again um, call Marilyn Sullivan if you want to register we'll get some pledges in and uh, raise some money for this outstanding cause her mm -hmm. phone number is 250-716-6110. Uh, call Marilyn, put up a, a, in a team and uh, be a part of this outstanding event. Karen, thanks so much oh, for coming on. And, and uh, one last cool. thing I heard recently, this is really exciting. Um, Michelle Stillwell is going to receive a torch award from the um, Harmony, World Harmony Run. This is a 20, uh, an international organization that's been running around the world for world peace, and they will be making an appearance at our Nanaimo Walk and Bounce on April the 21st. Very exciting. And again, mm -hmm. uh, Marilyn Sullivan, 250-716-6110. Thank you. And Dunya, that's it uh, for Karen and I. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ian. Great job on your first interview. Uh, I know it's a little hard, but you did a great job. Uh, and thank you to all of the volunteers who are here today. We have record 18 volunteers on this show. We haven't had that many before, so it's, it's a great thing. Uh, and this whole show is run by volunteers, basically. Um, that is it for the 23rd episode of the show. Uh, you can catch us online on YouTube, actually, and we have episodes over there. Our YouTube channel is Shaw TV Central VI, and you can also like us on Facebook and Twitter, if you like. Um, from all the staff and the volunteers here at Shaw TV, we'd like to thank you for watching. And once again, here is Kelly Gerben with What Have You Done? <laughs> Message from the train line today. The paper read, I'm coming on to stay. Tidied my room, put some curls in my hair. Looking out my window, waiting for you there. My stomach's still churning, I'm making for your touch. One shot of the whiskey doesn't come in much. The only question that I do believe is what have you done? What have you done? came with the setting sun the stars all came out one by one you looked for my light searching in the dark you opened the door and there you took my heart my stomach's still churning i'm making for your touch one shot of the whiskey doesn't come in much 
The only question that I do believe is what have you done, what have you done to me? My stomach's still churning, I'm making for your touch. One shot of the whiskey doesn't come in much. The only question that I do believe is what have you done, what have you done? What have you done? What have you done to me? What have you done? What have you done to me? What have you done to me?